Welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors or nonprofit leaders as they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Unity's Multimedia, and I would like to welcome to the program Mallory DePreckle of Communities and Schools of Michigan. In fact, she's the president and CEO of Communities and Schools of Michigan. Thanks for joining me on this program. Thanks, Paul. Glad to be here. (laughs) And so I forgot to preface this with you, but let's see if you can do it from memory. But I like to start each program with your mission. What is your mission? Oh, okay. Well, let's see if I can recite it from scratch, right? (laughs) So um, no, Communities and Schools of Michigan, our mission is to provide student supports uh, for students across the state, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. That is maybe a little messed up in there a little bit, but that's the basics of it. Um, Our job is to put a full-time site coordinator in school buildings to really provide any support they need so that they can graduate. So tell me right from the start, how did you find this role? Oh, how did I find this role? So I was working in a small nonprofit here in Lansing um, now almost six years ago. Uh, Yeah, almost six years ago and uh, as a director of education. And while I was there, I was actually connected to communities and schools as a partner. Um, And I saw the work that they were doing and how they were able to bring in small nonprofits in the Lansing area in particular into Lansing School District and and provide the supports they needed for students. So once I saw the job was posted, I uh, got in, you know, I applied and then I got the job. I'm a former teacher. So whenever I have an opportunity to bring education programming and educational equity into a classroom that aren't necessarily set up for it, I would do everything I can. Um, I always say that if I had communities and schools when I was teaching, I'd probably still be teaching. So there is a layer of this that feels like kind of a culmination of my nonprofit work and my education background. Um, and so I, you know, it's been five years now and we've grown a lot. So it's been really fun. Well, let's, let's dive into that educational background. You said you were a teacher. What did you teach? Uh, I was in Chicago Public Schools, um, and I was a Spanish and early uh, teaching English to second language students. Teaching stu- English to students of other languages is actually what it was called. That was my my minor at Michigan State. Um, and so I was in Chicago, and I was actually teaching pre-K through eighth grade Spanish. So as you can imagine, that is a wide range of students. I'm also not a native Spanish speaker, so there's lots of, you know, issues in that. We can get into all that at some point, but I was a Spanish teacher in buildings um, in Chicago, and I did it for about four years, and like I said, realized that what I wanted to do with and for the communities that I was in was bigger than my role as a teacher. Um, I wished that I could actually teach um, and do what I needed to do, but the students that I was working with, even just a half hour once a week as a specials teacher, um, needed more. And I, and I saw the systems that they were going up against and it just didn't sit right. And so from there, I was trying to figure out how I can support youth development and family engagement from the outside so that teachers have better uh, situations, right? Have easier, (laughs) easier time in the classroom because they're the professional teachers. Um, And so that's how I found nonprofit work. And then I uh, got my master's from DePaul and then we moved to Michigan and here I am. So are you originally from Michigan? I am not. No, I am not. I am, uh, well, born in Chicago, raised in San Diego. So that's where the Spanish came in. I'm actually, my high school was bilingual. So I had an entire, you know, my science books were in Spanish and English. So that's how I learned Spanish. And that's why I was able to teach it. Um, So I did that. And then I went to Michigan State because they had the number one education school in the country. So I went from San Diego to Michigan State. um, And then... That's kind of it. And my husband, my then boyfriend, and I moved to Chicago um, right after college. And I taught there for a while. And then we moved back here because he's a born and raised in Lansing. But I think now the math, I think now the math is I've been in Michigan. If you count my time at MSU, as long as I was in California, pretty much. So it's sort of, I'm a Michigander for all intents and purposes. I have the accent. I got the whole thing. (laughs) That, that's fair. I mean, I think when I calculate it, I live, I now have lived in Lansing the second longest than 
than I've lived anywhere else. There you go. So, so yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting. Um, what is it? I mean, I, I've noticed that you have a pattern here. You're a teacher. You um, went to the nonprofit world, but the nonprofit world revolved around education. So what was the, what was the framework of you going into education or be, having education just be your theme? Yeah, I think it's really, and I think about it a lot because I don't know why I became an educator, right? I think the joke, my dad will tell you that when I was a kid, I had really good handwriting and I could remember people's names. So he always told me, he's like, you should be a teacher because joke was like, that's all a teacher needs. Not true. You need a lot more than that to be a great teacher. Um, but I knew I always wanted to work with kids. And I think that there was this, um, you know, when I was in school, they didn't necessarily have like these human development and family services majors. They didn't have like parks and recs majors that really tailored to students. And so really, if you wanted to work with kids, you were a teacher. Um, and so that's kind of where I fell, right? I think looking back, if I had known that there were lots of opportunities to work with kids that were outside of a classroom, I probably, um, I don't know. I think I still would have gotten my degree in education, I think, but I probably would have done it differently, right? I think that there's, I'm glad that I had that background to, to really dig into it and learn like the pedagogy and the the, the, the why people, kids think the way they do. Um, but I think that we really like, those new careers focused on kids weren't really a thing um, when I was in high school, like looking at school. So it was really just, you want to work with kids, go be a teacher. Um, and so I've always been driven to working with children. I've always had a passion for it. I think that the realities of the world since I gave up teaching have really shifted what education means. And I think it's become this like system, right? It's always, it's always education system has always been a system, but this like uh, effect on education and effect on people going through the education system has just grown. And I've learned so much from the outside, like the outside of the classroom on how what is happening inside the classroom has such impact, but also the impact of outside the classroom on inside the classroom. And that's really where I've, I've understood the, you know, the, the challenges. I, you know, like I said, I grew up in California and my school by, it was bilingual because 80, 60% uh, of my school was Mexican. And of that 60% was probably 40% migrant, right? So my school was a majority minority which is an interesting way to grow up, right? Um, and that's why we, you know, it's just been in my in my bones to really be attuned to what that looks like and how that shapes education systems. And it benefited me, right? Because I can say I'm bilingual, I can teach, you know, Spanish, I can do all these things, but I am not necessarily sure that even though there was 80% of this population in my school, if they can say the same you know, benefit. And so I've really always had that in the back of my brain. Wow. That's, that's pretty interesting. It's like, uh, so, um, growing up being, well, I don't want to say, you, well, you under, well, I don't know, I guess you could say you were, you were pretty much bilingual because you <laughs> had to, you were reading as well as you were immersed and such. How, how did that, change going to different states what yeah I mean, if, you ask me, if you were asking me now i would tell you i can't speak spanish which is just horrifying <laughs> right like I, my I spent what is it five years lived in spain for six months you know like did the whole thing i really should still consider myself fluent but i don't use it um and that's the problem my kids probably know more than i do and they've learned it from preschool right so um I think it's just because it was immersive and I would just had to, we just learn, you know, our street names, right. We're in Spanish. It just is what it is. And so, um, moving Chicago has a, a large population of Spanish speakers. So when I was teaching, I was able to communicate, be out, like I, teachers would call me in to speak Spanish to the families, you know, in the gen ed classrooms. But, um, there's always something about, you know, not being native and there, you know, being a white woman speaking Spanish is a different thing than being a native Spanish speaker. And there's a um, community that, that I was never a part of, right? In California, it made sense, right? That's who we were in Southern California. 
But when you move to Chicago, that's not the case. And in Michigan, it's definitely not the case. And so it, it has been um, a growing experience, right? Like it was something that I always thought was such a strength and, and, and helped me get it, right? Get it, put that in quotes and understand what, what that meant. But the reality is, is that it actually was a privilege that I had a bilingual education. That's not something that everybody got. And and going to MSU and being a part of the College of Ed and them saying, you speak Spanish, you should be a Spanish teacher. I got a job three weeks out of school, right? Like it was not a, it was not a problem. Um, and it just, it helped me a lot. But I'm, again, I don't think I can say the same for everyone. No, I think that, no, I think that's fair. And also, um, now you mentioned that you did, you taught uh, in schools for a little bit, then you thought that you need, there was more, there was more that you could do in that. Uh, so you went to school to in DePaul. What did you graduate with at DePaul? Um, so at DePaul, I received my master's in public service management, which is basically their MBA program for nonprofit work. So my path was primarily MBA classes, but then I had a, a public service sort of lens on it. Um, and I did that after. So between teaching and DePaul, I was working at the YMCA in Evanston um, and doing a lot of their youth development work there. And so I knew I had made the switch, right? I had I had left teaching and I knew I needed to be in nonprofit work. But what I never got as an education student was like business. Like I didn't know anything <laughs> about, you know, how to, what a profit and loss sheet is, what a board is, right? Like that's all stuff that I just didn't really know. And so going to school made it clear, right? That this is, this is how I wish I had learned to put all those skills together, right? And it, it got me to learn about advocacy and what that really means and that you, you know, being mission driven and that your life becomes your work, whether you want it to or not as an executive director of an organization. So I, it really sort of tunnel visioned me into like, this is, this is your brain. We know what you need. You know what you want. This is how you can really use it to your advantage. And then working at the small organization here in Lansing and being their director of education, I was able to see sort of the, the bigger picture a little bit. Once we moved here, I, I saw the big picture of Lansing and how community and small nonprofits can really benefit the districts and the schools are in. Um, and then it just kind of spiraled <laughs> for the best, but in the right direction. I guess spiral implies bad. I would say no. what, what's the opposite of spiral? Going up, it went up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spiraling up. Yes. I, think, I think we can say that. Um, exploded. I don't know. Yeah. It was good. It all yeah. worked out. It yeah. all had to come together in this little. It all nice worked package. out in the end. That's exactly, exactly. But going into that, though, you had worked in nonprofits for a while. But this, I believe, communities and schools is your first. Like, you're the boss. <laughs> yeah, for sure. This is the first. That all it, it's. I, you know, I don't like to say it's all on me because it's not right. I don't really do a whole lot. It's my staff that do all the good with the hard work. But the this is my this is my baby, right? This is one of them. And I think I've told you this in conversations, but I didn't know what I was getting into when I started here, right? When when I started at communities and schools in Lansing, it was four schools, and so it was, and those staff were all contractors. So I was the one full time paid salaried, no, they're all paid. I say salaried employee at the time. Um, and so I just thought, again, it was going to be this little nice little package, little organization that we were going to do great work in schools and we're going to have a great contract with Lansing School District and it was all going to be great. And if we can expand and add a few here or there, it'd be great. Um, it's been a lot more than that. <laughs> and it's, uh, it was, again, the opposite of spirals. <laughs> um, and and uh, it's been a growing experience for me and for everybody. I'm grateful that I um, come from a family of business people um, mm. because that mindset, right? Like I have the social service, big heart kind of world um, and not that, you know, my family doesn't, but they were able to be like, okay, so do you have this, do you, do you understand what this really means? Do you get what you're going to need, <laughs> you know? And so they kind of, I was able to bounce ideas off of it from the business side that like growth comes with problems and bit, what do they say? More money, more problems, more growth, more problems. And so it's been a, a huge, huge learning opportunity, but I do have a really great board who was helpful and all that. And, you know, there's just, there's also in Lansing, a really nice network of 
executive directors who all, I, I believe, truly respect each other and want us all to succeed. And so it's been nice to sort of have those folks to bounce ideas off of as well. Absolutely. I think that that's really, really key. But um, but communities and schools is also part of, it's like a, a branch of a national organization. What is that hierarchy like? What How does that work? Yeah. So it's, so yeah. So communities and schools of Michigan, which is what I oversee, we are in 73 schools across the state. Right. So we we joke we're coast to coast now. Um, so Battle Creek to Ypsilanti, basically all around the 94 and, and up and around. Um, and so that's where we are. And then there's also a communities and schools of Kalamazoo, which has their own separate executive director, um, own board or own everything. They're their own entity. And then there's CIS of Northwest Michigan, which is like Kalkaska and Mansalona. So there's actually three. Currently, there's three affiliates in Michigan. At one point in time, there were five. But for lots of reasons, things happen, um, the world changes. And so there's three now. And so we are all our own individual nonprofits. We play nicely, right? We're, we're friends. We lobby together, all of that. But we are our own affiliates. And then there's a national communities and schools. And I always get this number wrong. And they're growing. They actually just got a huge grant to grow more. But um, it's like couple hundred, maybe 110, something. I feel like that number, there's 110-ish affiliates across the country um, doing the same work we are just in various states. So the most um, the, the, the most affiliates are in Texas. Um, and then there, you know, there's Mid-America, there's CIS of Seattle, there's CIS of Florida, they're like all over. And then we have a national body that we don't have to pay dues into. We don't have to, you know, where they, they really, their job is to make sure that we are aligned with the standards that we say we're doing and also that we're following the model. And our model is an evidence-based model. So, and it's all data-driven. So they're collecting our data. They're making sure we're doing what we're saying we're doing. We're doing it with fidelity and we're really in line with what we do. So that's where national is really important to us. Our, our system, our CIS data management software um, and, and support, right? So when I started this job, like I said, I, I didn't realize it was a state job. I thought it was just a Lansing job. And, and the people at national were like, Mallory, and you signed up for something different. Here you go. This is what the job is. And so they've been really helpful in, in mentoring me um, through this whole process. So that's that's national. But yeah, there's, I don't know, I think they, there's a number. I know they, I feel like the number changes every year, but it's like 110 ish. We serve 55,000 students in the state, the three of us together. Um, and so they're, and they're trying now to be in every Title I school in the country. So that's the goal now on the national strategic plan and so they just got a big grant um like 166 and a half million dollars not to us to the whole country um to to do that and to really add to every title one school so we'll see how that works here um i'm pretty sure of a 73 that we're in i would bet 90 plus are already title one schools 90 percent of them are already title one so we're doing our part but there's always more so we'll see well let's talk about that grant, I think being part of the national organization allows you to have a little bit of some of that, or the funding is split up in certain ways that, that you would benefit from. How are you able to use um, that in the programming that you're doing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the the ability for national to get these big grants are, are awesome. This big one they just announced, I think yesterday, so I'm not like breaking news. Um, but they, it's 166 million from the Balmer Group, which is actually a Michigan-based organization who has funded us in the long in, in for a while in the Detroit area. So mm. we actually don't get to apply for this round of grants with them because we're already getting funding. But in cohort two, um, we will. And so that's really neat. But we did also, I mean, it'd be silly to ignore the fact that when was it last December? We also received a Mackenzie Scott grant, right? And that is something that directly to us, right? Community and School of Michigan got it. It was not through national. Oh. Um, but because of the national impact that we have, that's no question. That's why the spotlight was on CIS of Michigan. So we were one of 43 of the affiliates. So not all of them got the money from Mackenzie Scott, but um, we were one of them. And $2.25 million later, we're in a lot more schools because of it. So it's been, you know, there's definitely a recognition that comes with it. I think that there's um, 
you know, I, I think that there's a piece of it that that Michigan is doing something right. We're doing something great and it's nice to be recognized for it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, usually besides the Mackenzie Scott grant, if National gets a big grant like this 166 million from Balmer, we apply for it. We have to you know, fill out a grant and then National figures out how much money everybody's getting based on that. It's not an equal slice of the pie necessarily. That's amazing. I didn't realize that it was two different. I was only, I was only thinking about the Mackenzie Scott grant. I yeah, no, it's two. There was a second one. That's it's two. Yeah, the awesome. second one was just announced yesterday. So this has been two. They call them transformational or transcend. What did he just use it? Not not apocalyptic. Epic. <laughs> epic. Epic. <laughs> um, yeah, again, the opposite. I'm learning spiraling and yeah. apocalyptic. Yeah, no, apocalyptic um, is not. I don't think there's a. a a reversal of that one. Yeah, no, that's true. Good point. Um, yeah. So yeah, they're both, I mean, they're huge. They're huge for what we do. Um, yeah. And the difference, right, is that Mackenzie Scott was unrestricted directly to communities and schools in Michigan and to the affiliates we got. So we were able to do whatever we wanted with it. Um, and we didn't know it was coming. Like they called me and they said, hey, Mallory, we got this money. How do you feel about taking $2.25 million? And I was like, <laughs> yes, thank you. You know, I <laughs> this is amazing. Um, Whereas the bomber is obviously it's a bigger number um, and we can apply for whatever we want from it, but we do need to apply for it. And it is granted to us. Okay. So you, do you, so you have to be specific on what yeah. you're trying to, on what we're going to do. And it, and it's to expand, right? So it's to add title one schools. Okay. So we have to be really like, thankfully, actually, we have another year to figure out where we're going to go, but, but we will, we'll use it right to, to expand. We've talked about adding rural schools. We've talked about, adding where we are, um, you know, more schools where we are. So we'll see, we got a year to figure it out, but we'll, we'll definitely go after it. So looking back, you, you said you've been here at, uh, communities and schools in the position you're in for about five years, correct? Yep. So what would you feel other than the grant, uh -huh. um, grants now, um, <laughs> what would you consider your biggest success thus far? Who? So they, they're also interconnected, right? Because we wouldn't have grown if we didn't get the money. But I do think before we even got Mackenzie Scott money, we were in 50 schools. Don't quote me on that. Well, you know, something like that. 50-ish schools. Last year, we were in 50 schools. So that growth, I mean, is just unprecedented and unheard of. And that was during the pandemic, right? So I, I Paul, you've heard me say this in my speeches at our events, but the, right, this is the first time I think it's fair to say that people are acknowledging that what teachers do is really hard, that they need support, our kids need mental health support, and we need to do more. And so what has happened is there's been this insane spotlight on wraparound supports, on community schooling, on the idea of bringing in, organ you know, supports for students that are not just academic. And because of that, our growth has been, that's why we grew, right? Like that's the reality of it. Districts were able to use money to pay for us. Um, and we really, we took advantage of a situation, a horrible pandemic that actually helped support students in the long run. So now the question is, how do we sustain, right? And I think that's where the scary part is as an executive director of like, we did this, how do we do, you know, how do we make it last? And that's why the Mackenzie Scott grant is so nice because it is unrestricted and a lot of it's been invested. And so it is the goal of ours to keep it for sustainability purposes, but that's the scary part, right? Because once ARPA dollars go away and once the world kind of goes back to the way it was, right? We keep saying we want it to go back to normal, but I don't, right? I don't want the world to go back to normal because that means that kids aren't getting what they need. And I, and I confidently feel like this is the chance and this is the legislature and this is the whole, the world is kind of in this, nobody wants their kids home anymore, right? Like they knew what that was like. And they want, they understand that these kids need a lot. And so I don't want to go back to what it was um, because then we're in a whole other, you know, world as communities and schools and as people truly. So. Absolutely. Well, I mean, what would you say was your biggest learning moment? Or most important learning moment. Most important role. learning moment. Yes. Um, I think it goes back to growth too. I mean, I think, right, our team, our, our staff, our people are what has, beyond the money, right? The, the staff is what makes us good. 
and those staff that are in the school buildings 40 hours, 60 hours a week with their students um, are the ones who deserve, you know, all the flowers, right? <laughs> that they deserve what they, sh they get. And um, I wish that there was more we could do for them, right? I think educators and educator proxy people, right, or support staff deserve all of the praise, all of the money, all of the everything in the world. Um, and unfortunately, that's just not, again, the way our systems are set up, right? So um, I think my biggest learning curve has been to do everything I can to appreciate the hard work, right? My job's easy. I get to sit and talk to you for a half hour, right? Like that's not, that's not a tough job. The tough job is um, being in schools, especially now, right? We're, we're dealing with things in schools that students have never, or teachers, students, look, I didn't learn, you know, I, when I was in college of ed, nobody taught me what an active shooter drill was. Like that was not part of my, there was no class, right? It, that, that, that wasn't part of it. That's not what I signed up to do. Um, and I know that's not why teachers are teaching. And so from that lens, I think my biggest learning has been how do you appreciate in, in a way that's not condescending, right? In a way that is true to who your staff are and what their needs are um, and recognize that what they're doing every day is impossible task, right? You, you're going to go down a rabbit hole with students trying to find them every support they possibly can get so they can graduate. It's a big, th there's barriers. And so the systems are not set up to, to succeed, right? Like, like I said, like we finally have money and we finally care about kids and this is great, but there's like obstacle after obstacle after obstacle that the kids are going to hit to get there. And so that's been my biggest lesson in all of this, right? The biggest takeaway has been like, you can throw everything you want at it, but there's still just the system, man. <laughs> the system is not set up for success. Well, that's a good point that you brought up about active shooter. I mean, th this is a, a situation that is like very, very 21st century. Um, <laughs> 2000. Yeah, it's horrible. So yes. what, it, what, what is, does community and schools have a policy for this or or what is their what is their approach um, from a, a national to even to where you are? Is there yeah, I mean the fact that we even have to talk about it, right, is horrifying. And I think that we're all kind of in that that space now, right? Like we're we're living it here in Lansing today, two days out, right, from the Michigan State shootings. And I think that we're all just numb, unfortunately, to it. I think in terms of our policy, we don't have one in particular, like in our policy handbook about active shooters or anything like that, but we do have, um, we, we follow whatever policies of the district are, right? We follow their suspension policies. We follow whatever we can. We'll do everything we can to be restorative with these policies before kids get suspended in that case, but we don't have a policy in and of itself. I will say that we are now advocating, our site coordinators are advocating really hard to know what those safety plans are in the school building and to be the voice of those safety plans, because if they are going to be called on to be a first responder, um, they are absolutely entitled to know what that plan is. And I think that legislatively, that is something that should be systematized and should be clear. Um, I think some schools are safer than others in terms of, you know, entryways and entry points. Um, but, you know, I mean, we're looking this, you know, looking into next year and every year we do a huge backpack giveaway in Lansing. And like last year we gave away 900 backpacks. I'm not ordering backpacks this year because they may need to be plastic and clear. Like we don't know, right? So we're following the lead of what the districts want while simultaneously recognizing that school shootings are a pandemic and an epidemic maybe is the right word. Um, and that from our perspective, and I think at Nationals perspective would be, you are not keeping kids in school if they are dying. That is not success, right? Schools are supposed to be safe spaces. And if they are not, then we are not doing our jobs. And we will do everything we can. We, you know, hold spaces for our staff to really engage and to, to talk to each other and have um, conversa difficult conversations about this kind of stuff. But, you know, I wish we had a, an answer. Um, but like I said, they didn't sign up for this. And so it's, it's hard. It's exhausting work. There's a lot of burnout. Um, we recognize that and we do offer PTO and, and mental health days and, and, and really do try to do what we can for our staff, recognizing that like, 
there's no solution. And I, I, I wish it to them, you know, I wish that we had a plan, but we will be there as there needs to be a plan. We'll be an advocate. You know, I, I would love to be on safe city councils and all that kind of stuff because it all is so important. And just to wrap this up with a segue off of, you know, PTO and dealing with these situations, what do you do to escape? What do you do to like take some time away for you? What, what are, what are some of the things that you'd like to do? Or my self-care? I mean, I'm drinking my Starbucks, so that's, you know, (laughs) kind of how I get through my life. Um, You know, I, I'm lucky, right. That I can shut down. I, unlike a lot of smaller organizations who, and, and executive directors who are literally in the weeds as well as in big picture, I don't have that. I'm very big picture every day. Um, but it's still tough, right? I worry every day about my staff and what they're going through. And so I wish I had an answer. I don't, I'm not very good at it. I have a Peloton and I like to do a Peloton every now and then I should do it more. Um, but Starbucks and my Peloton maybe and Costco. <laughs> Those are the three things. Hey, hey, there's no right or wrong answer. It's what, <laughs> what you do for yourself, but yes. I really appreciate you coming on the program, Mallory. It's been, it's been awesome to hear a little bit more about your story and how you. your, your journey here and uh thanks thanks again for for uh uh being this interview i appreciate it thank you paul thanks for making me like you know i've been pushing you to get me on so thanks for letting <laughs> me on that is true that is true <laughs> And thank you again, all in the audience, for taking some time to listen to this program. And don't miss the next episode that will be coming out in a couple weeks. If there is someone that you know of that you would like to hear more about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on our YouTube channel or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. So thank you all for listening and catch us next time in the Control Center.